If you look at enough late 18th or early 19th century swords, you're going to come across this phenomenon where certain blades will say that they are warranted or warranted never to fail. Now, what is that and why is it important? Hi, I'm Nick Thomas at the Academy of Historical Fencing. I'm going to show you today a warranted sword, explain what they are and why they were important. So, to get into this, we need to just look at the late 18th century and some of the problems that were existing with swords and swordsmanship at the time, specifically swords for this video, is that uh, the British Army officer Gaspard de la Manchin, who later became very famous, uh, in the Low Countries in 1792 to 1795, he fought there and found that British swordsmanship and swords were found wanting. And he found that the swords were brittle, um, unwieldy, heavy, just bad. He didn't like them and he didn't like the swordsmanship that was being used either. And um, he took influence from mostly the Austrians that they were fighting alongside. And he found that Austrian swords and swordsmanship were really, really much better. And he drew a lot of influence from them. And he came back to England and he proposed a new sword and a new sword system. And he worked with the, the swordsmith um, Henry Osborne from Birmingham, who was one of the best of his day. And together they devised a new sword pattern. And that was the famous 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre, which is you know, one of the most famous sabres ever made. And whilst they were doing that, not only did they create a new design that they thought handled better, but also they, d they developed a system for proofing them, um, or proving them, if you like. And that meant they tested every single blade to ensure that it was of a good enough quality. And they tested them in such a way that they would um, go through the kind of hardships that they would expect to face in battle. That was the idea. <clears throat> And so they developed this proofing system and what it meant is they went through a procedure where they beat the sword against wood on the flats, both flats and the edge and the back. So they beat the edges on a, on a round wooden block and that was called uh, chopping. Beat it hard and see if basically the blade deforms, bends or causes any significant edge damage. Then they hit it on a flat block of wood on the flats and that was called slapping. And then they tested the, um, uh, the, the flexibility um, and they had to bend uh, one inch for every six inches of blade. So what that meant is, is you had to flex this blade from a 32 inch, which was regulation, they were actually 32 to 33, but roughly 32 inch, it had to flex down so that it was 27 inches in length. So that's actually a lot of curve. And then it has to return true. And in that you'll find basically is the blade tempered well enough to return true and is it too brittle to snap and so yeah so you've got tests of <clears throat> the edges the flats and the, and the rigidity and and will it return true the flexibility and the temper and that was the sword proofing and it got adopted <clears throat> as an army standard so that any swords bought under government contract were then tested with this system and given inspection stamps so if i look at a uh, government inspection stamped sword. So this is a um, heavy cavalry sword and it has the government or one of the government in inspection stamps there on the blade. So this was made by another Birmingham maker which is um, Josh um, Reddell and Co. And this is therefore a common trooper's sword that's been through those testing procedures initially developed by Osborne. Now this is where it gets interesting because this is where we now understand what a warranted sword is. Officers had to buy their own swords. And that was the case all the way up until the start of World War I in 1914. So basically the, the whole period that, that swords were in use as an actual weapon, realistically, there wasn't much use after that, um, officers had to buy their own swords. So they were what we would call private purchase. So um, a common soldier or even a sergeant would have a government co contracted sword provided to them. An officer had to go and buy their own sword. And when they did that, they could buy it from anywhere they wanted and as a result the quality could vary massively because they could go to a high quality um, uh, smith like uh, or cutler like Henry Osborne um, or, um, or Thomas Gill as this is. This is a Thomas Gill and as is on the t-shirt. This is a t-shirt that I designed from their original trading card. If you like the Gill t-shirt you can uh, go down to our description and get it from Redbubble. So Gill, like Osborne, was famous for being one of the finest smiths of his day. And an officer could go to someone like Gill or Osborne, um, or a retailer that's bought their stuff wholesale, because that did also happen. 
or they could go to any number of other suppliers. So they could go, for example, to uh, get a Runkel um, blade or sword. So Runkel was uh, German imported blades that were then hilted up, maybe completely by, uh, by Runkel and maybe not, but they certainly were provided to other basically hilt makers, what we call furniture makers. So a furniture maker is someone who gets blades in and makes the hilt themselves to hilt up a complete sword, but the blade is not their own. And this term came about that is tailor's sword. So it is actually as it sounds, you buy your sword from a tailor as in the person who makes your clothing. And it was common for tailors to stock everything because when an officer needs to buy all their kit, it's expensive and it's a lot of stuff. And they sometimes or often went to one outfitter or tailor and bought it all. So you might get your uniform, your hat, your sword, maybe even your saddle um, and your camp equipment and you might buy all of it. <clears throat> and if they did that, the quality of the sword they got would be a roll of the dice, basically. That outfitter could have bought um, wholesale from, you know, uh, Osborne or, or Gill, or they could have just gone to anyone else, and there were lots of different sword makers around and of varying quality. So officers' swords did not go through the proofing stages that a regulation sword did for a common soldier, a government, basically government-contracted sword. <clears throat> and so, to, to guarantee that you were getting that quality, the better quality makers started proofing the officer's swords. So there was no requirement to do it because they're private purchase swords. But if you get a warranted sword, what they're saying is you're paying to, to know that you've got the quality of at least a government contracted sword, which is, you know, it's supposed to be high quality, reliable military equipment, not of just anything you buy off the high street. And that's what it means. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a sword that is unbreakable, but warranted never to fail, just warranted, does suggest, or no, it means that they've been thoroughly tested with all of the tests of the day. And there is that guarantee that if it does fail, it will be replaced. Now, usually you will pay a good bit of money to get a warranted blade at the time because inevitably you're paying for quality, therefore. Now, there is a possibility that it also was among some manufacturers, if not all, a marketing strategy as well, because to put that warranted mark on your blade, you can charge more money for, it's more exclusive, and there's a possibility, therefore, that some makers were a little unscrupulous and just chucking it on there anyway to basically get a bit more money. And you will find swords in the period that say they're warranted, but have no manufacturer's mark on there. Now, that might be an accident, because sometimes you'll find manufacturer's markings aren't on the, on the sword at all, and they might just be found on the scabbard, and many scabbards have been lost. So that might actually be genuine in some cases, but it might also be pretty suspect, as you may well have found some outfitters and, and smaller uh, companies putting warranted on their blades just to make a bit more money or gain a few more sales. So it's possible that it was to some degree a marketing strategy and also abused by unscrupulous sellers or dealers. But in the case of a high quality and renowned smith such as um, Gill or Osborne, and there are others, um, you will find that you are getting the finest quality swords of the day. So it means that you are ensuring that you go to war with the best sword you can possibly get. So if you were going to um, go to war at that time, you would surely want a warranted blade because you know you're getting the best. And what I'm holding here is a warranted never to fail light cavalry sabre of the 1796 regulation by Thomas Gill. Although it is rather unusual in that it has this um, beaked pommel which is also faceted. I mean beaked pommels are unusual in themselves so the 1796 normally has um, this kind of just rounded pommel or back strap section, but you can see this is what we would call beaked and is also faceted, which means it's not completely round. It actually has all these flat sections that's faceted on the actual pommel or back strap. And this is a curious sword because it's probably an officer's sword um, based on the features that are unusual because they're not regulation features, things like this. Um, the um, what we call the ears because this is pinned so this is a uh, also um, developed by uh, Henry Osborne and uh, and uh, Gaspard Le Marchant is rather than just peening the sword on the bottom you also pin it through the tang which means you've got two strengthening points to ensure that 
the blade is nice and firmly strong to the tang and the grip and the hilt and everything else. So this is probably an officer's sword, which is curious because it doesn't have any fancy features, if you like. So the officer's version of the 1796 light cav, they um, normally have a slightly kind of swirly ears as opposed to simple ears, um, if you like, and they have blue and gilt blades, normally, not always. But this sword, as you can see, has none of that. So this sword, if this is an officer's sword, and it probably is, what the officer has done is they've paid for the finest fighting sword with none of the fanciness. So they've put their money where it was most important for a fighting sword. Because um, this beak pommel, it probably isn't just for fashion, even though it might have been for some. It's actually more to do with um, pistol grip grips that were used at the time. Uh, not always, but something that was being done at the time. So this is a very functional, high quality fighting sword where the officer has emphasized only what he wanted out of a fighting weapon and nothing fancy. And that kind of feeds well into the warranted idea. So yeah, warranted or warranted never to fail. It doesn't mean it's never going to fail, but it is warranted, it has warranty, and it has been through all of the test procedures developed by Henry Osborne and Gaspard Le Marchand. And actually, Thomas Gill was known to have taken it even further because um, Thomas Gill wanted a very high quality blade and he was also struggling against uh, the Runkel German produced blades at the time. There was a lot of testing going on in Britain and, and with the Ordnance Board and Gill developed more strategies again to test them even further. So he was actually testing his blades against, um, well, metal rods and bars um, and he developed a machine to test the, um, the, the thrust system that I talked about where it reduces down to 27 inch and his machine was eventually adopted by the, uh, the Tower Armoury. And so you can tell with Thomas Guild you're getting a sword that has been very thoroughly and rigorously tested to give you the best sword you can possibly get and the best chance that it won't break. Although ultimately if you know anything about swords you'll know that the best sword in the world can break um, but you're guaranteeing that you'll get the best of them. So there you go, that's Warranted Swords. If you'd like to know a little bit more about the history of Gaspard um, Le Marchant and how he got around to developing the, uh, the Light Cavalry Saber and, and the testing procedures that became in uh, standard for the British Army, then you can buy his memoir. It's, it's, it's widely published and um, it's really quite fascinating because it talks about his time early on in the army, his experiences of swords and swordsmanship, um, his encounters with the French and his experiences with the Austrians and how basically they got to producing these kinds of swords with these kinds of testing procedures. So there you go, that is uh, warranted or warranted never to fail. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video.